Hello, I'm Jamila Musaiva, an international social etiquette consultant and the author of two books, Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know and Afternoon Tea Etiquette. This video was highly requested by most of my subscribers and is dedicated to study tips. As a former student once, as a teacher now, I have collected some very useful tips that I hope you'll find very applicable in your daily lives. Before I share the study tips with you, I want to give a little bit of story about me and more about my life as a student in the US. So I went to college when I was only 16 years old. We studied here 11 years in Azerbaijan and when I was 16 I was already a freshman in college. I went to the George Washington University and I studied international relations with double minors in history and sociology. I was a very nerdy kid, I loved to study, and being brought up in a very traditional Azerbaijani household, I was always told that the one that studies the most, or the longest, and spends days and nights in the library, is the one that gets the best results. I was told by my father when he was dropping me off in college that I should always sit in the front row, because the good students would sit in the front row. And now you can imagine, this is US, a lecture hall of 200 and over people, 250 I think people, and I was one, probably the only student who sat in the front row because the cool kids would sit in the back rows or in the rows inside so they can easily leave the room without being noticed. So I was the only one who sat there in the front row. But the story gets even more interesting because when I arrived in college, I had six courses and each of that course had a lot of textbooks to read. So I went and purchased all those textbooks and my parents were surprised as to how many books I had to carry around to college. If you have ever seen Joe W, it's basically we have lots of different buildings around the city. It's not just one building and I would have to take myself from one building to another and therefore my parents decided that was a good idea to buy me a roly trolley backpack so it's a backpack on wheels where i would collect all my textbooks and just carry it around like that in college so i'm 16 in college walking around gw with a roly trolley backpack at that time i wasn't ashamed of it i actually didn't think it was funny in any way, but apparently the cool kids, who later became my friends, told me that they had this inside joke about me and that they would be able to spot me in the library wherever I was because I would park my rolly trolley right in front of the desk that I was seated at so they would be able to spot where I was <laughs> at that time. It was funny then, but I wasn't really ashamed of it in any way. And the reason I'm sharing this story is because I was brought up thinking that the student that studies day and nights in the library that spends a lot of time reading textbook attends the lecture in the front row is the one that gets the best results apparently not truth be told the first year my freshman year in college was the most difficult one for me because it was such a huge transition from school to university and the amount of information i had to read and assimilate was a lot more so the first year was super challenging and with my mentality that I had to read day and night that I had to spend long hours studying was actually making me feel very exhausted and stressed. Eventually over time I did learn how to study smarter instead of harder and this video is dedicated to exactly that, how to teach you to study smarter not harder. The reason I urge everyone to study smarter instead of harder because from my personal experience, the first year in college that I studied the hardest I ever did, I actually got the lowest GPA that I got through the rest of the years. Every other year that I studied studying smarter instead of harder, my GPA went up and up and up and eventually I graduated summa cum laude from the GW University. So what Summa cum laude stands for, for those who are unfamiliar with Latin terms, it means with the highest distinction. And that's the highest distinction you can get in the US. Upon graduation, I became a member of Phi Beta Kappa, which is the oldest honor society in the US, and also Golden Key International Honor Society, which is the largest honor society for undergraduates and graduates. Now this video comes not only from a former student uh, who knows the struggle of studying, but also from a teacher of over five years of experience, knowing what exactly it is that teachers are looking for when they are testing you. Tip number one is understanding what is your primary medium of information assimilation. 
In other words, what is your primary channel through which you understand information the best? Is it your eyes? Is it your ears? Or sensory, your hands? So if you are a person who likes to simulate the information through the eyes, you're more visual, you need to see the information in front of your eyes to understand it. For some people, it could be audio, it could be through listening for the information, they assimilate the most amount of information. For others, they have to take notes, they have to write it down, they have to sort of uh, draw diagrams or charts to really understand it. You have to identify what is your primary channel because all of us are able to simulate information in all three ways, but it's the one channel that we simulate the most amount of information through. Know your channel because that will help you understand what techniques you need to adapt in order to understand information faster and better. Personally, I am a more visual person. I need to visually see the information in front of my eyes, which is probably why I chose YouTube as my primary platform for sharing information, because I am the person who learns when watches or sees it done, and I like to deliver the information in the same way. A lot of you have been asking me to do podcasts and you said you will be loving to hear my voice and I understand it and I really like listening to podcasts as well, but I do so for entertainment purposes. I would probably be washing dishes and listening to podcasts. Unfortunately, I'm not able to retain much of information through audio perception only. I need to see it. Uh, same with audiobooks. I can't listen to them because I fall asleep to them. It's very difficult for me to retain information through audiobooks. I need a hard copy, I need to highlight, I need to see the information right in front of my eyes. My husband, on the other hand, is the one that understands most of the information through audio, through hearing. He loves listening to audiobooks, he listens to them in the car, I don't know how he doesn't fall asleep to them. He loves listening to podcasts. So knowing your primary medium of understanding information is important because that will help you to find the right way of studying. Tip number two, always look through the study guides, study schemes, whatever it's called in your course, in your lecture. In the beginning of the course, usually the professor or teacher will share with you the schemes or, or the general major learning points or learning objectives, whatever they might call it. It might be called differently in your course, but the idea is the same. They outline the topics and what are the topics or themes or the concepts or the ideas that you need to know at the end of that chapter or unit. Make sure that you print it out and have it in front of your eyes first just skim through it in the beginning of the year and then right before you are going to study each chapter just look at the major learning points there is a reason the study scheme is there it's there to help you prepare for the exam revise for the exam and know what your professor or teacher will be testing you on so here I have an example of a scheme of work that I prepared. I just have a little excerpt from the whole and here for example we have two different chapters that we need to cover and then on, right next to the chapter I have the ideas outlined or the concepts that the students need to pay attention to. This is a perfect way of also revising for the exam because when you are preparing for the exam you can open the study scheme and look for example let's say we are studying marketing um, or market research and positioning and then I have different ideas that I want them to know and when they are preparing they just can skim through and see is there anything there that is still unfamiliar or the thing they have forgotten or the thing they can't define that is the right way to study they can always go back to the textbook and try to refresh their memory so study schemes or guides are super important do not neglect them Tip number three is print out or prepare or see presentations. If your course has a presentation, make sure to print it out and have it with you during the lecture. If your course doesn't have a presentation, you can prepare for yourself a PowerPoint presentation of the chapter that you have been studying. That way, making your life easier because when it's time to take the exam, you're all gonna have already all the important major ideas, concepts, key highlighted information there in your PowerPoint. Usually, most of the professors will share their PowerPoint presentation 
and there is also a reason why there is information there. And the information that's reflected there is usually the one the professor is going to be testing you on. Do not neglect PowerPoint presentations just like the study schemes. A little tweak that I've been taught in college that helped me actually improved immensely the time I spent on studying or reviewing for the exam and really changed my mindset when I was preparing for the exam was the way I printed my PowerPoint presentations and I want to show it to you right now so you also have an idea of why it made it look easier when you print it the way that I was printing later on. So this is a very classical way of printing PowerPoint presentation, usually two slides or one slide or maybe three slides tops per page, which is very easy to look through and you can clearly see what is written there. So this is a PowerPoint presentation. And this is, let's say, an amount of papers that I need to review for a given chapter. I was then taught to print six or nine slides per page. Of course, it's much more difficult to now read through them because it's not very visible. I have to really bring it very close to me to be able to see what's written there. But now I've diminished the number of pages I have to review. So I only have three papers to go through instead of a whole bunch here. What it did to my mind is that it tricked it. It made it seem like I have less information to review. It's the same amount, it's just less number of paper. First, you're saving paper, and second, it makes it look like you have less to revise. Also, when you're revising for the exam, it's easy to lay it out, this paper, right in front of your eyes like that. So just three papers to revise and just quickly go over the slides in your mind and think what are the topics or what are the concepts that I'm not able to define or understand or contextualize. And if you can cover it all, then you're good to go for the exam. Tip number four is taking notes. Uh, there are people that take notes in the same way for every single class. For me, I learned that for each class, I took different kind of notes and I'll say what the difference is. But before I talk about it, I just want to say that I would print my presentations prior to the class, prior to the lecture, which would usually be posted before. And then I would take them to, to lecture hall and around the areas that were open, so there wasn't written anything, I would be taking my notes there. And if I didn't have enough space there, I would use the back of the paper here to write the ideas. So I would just write them here on the sides or here on the top, on the, in the middle, in the middle, and the bottom. And then whatever was missing or I wasn't able to locate, I would be writing right at the back of the paper. That way, when the time came for revision, I would have everything in just three papers. It made it look like I have less work to do. As I mentioned before, I would be taking different kind of notes for different kind of classes. So when I was taking biology or economics, I would handwrite my notes. I would never type them. So if there's a graph or a diagram or a chart or something to label or a formula, I would write it out with my hands because that way I think it was much better assimilated in my memory because I would see it visually, handwrite it, so two mediums would come together and the information was very well kept in my memory. Whereas for classes like international relations or history, I would usually type my notes because the teacher would be just telling a story or sharing an information, a theory, a concept, and they would usually talk very fast. So handwriting was not an option for me. I would instead type my notes. Once I've typed them after the lecture, I would print them out and attach them to the slides or the PowerPoint presentation that was exactly about that lecture. So to keep them all together and ready for revision when the day comes. Tip number five is revise the information within the first 24 hours when possible. And I urge you to do that if you have time. Of course, if you have other things to pay attention to at that moment, do that, prioritize. But if you have time, make sure that you revise the chapter or revise the unit or read the corresponding chapter within the first 24 hours. I learned this in college that there's a thing called curve of forgetting, which means if we learn something for the very first time or hear something for the very first time, if we revise it for the first 24 hours after hearing it, we're going to be able to retain 80%, up to 80% of information. 
if we revise it again within a week time, we can, and then again in a week time, we can actually learn it 100%. So that means without extra effort, you can actually retain the information very, very quickly. I know when we're in college, we have five and six courses to attend. We have papers that are due and we have exams or tests to take. So prioritizing the work that needs your attention first is important. But if you have time and if the chapter is not too long and if it's not going to take too much time, make sure that you revise your notes or the lecture or the unit within the 24 hours of hearing it. Also, speaking of the curve of forgetting, I told you that I will give you some tips on how to take notes from the textbook. As I said, you would better do it once the lecture finishes, you come home within the 24 hours, you open the textbook and you start reading it. And then while reading, I like to highlight the important ideas or the important information. And then I rewrite that from the textbook, either to my computer, I type it in, or I write it down in the notes. Therefore, when I am reviewing the information, I have all the information from textbook, from lecture, from PowerPoint presentation, all in one place. Tip number six is learn how to skim. I actually was never taught that in school. We were never taught how to skim through the book or through a journal or article. I learned it only when I was in college and I was taught that by a professor of mine. Uh, actually, I went into his office hours and I told him, you know, I can't finish this whole book in, you know, two days that you have assigned it. And he was like, I don't expect you to read it. And I said, what? what? What do you mean by you assigned it to read? He said, don't read, just skim. I was like, what is that? And then he explained to me that skimming is basically running with your ear through the text or through the journal or the article and trying to extract the important information from there. Because if you think about that, most of what we're reading, especially if it's an academic writing, it's just, you know, repetition of certain concepts, it's like argumentation. If you are able to extract the important information from these large articles, you'll be able, you're going to be able to cover a lot more readings in a shorter period of time. I already anticipate that some of you would ask me what is skimming and how do I skim through the book or an article. And the way I was told to do that was, for example, let's say there's an academic article. You'd read the introduction, then you'll read the first couple of lines in the first paragraph and the ending lines of the first paragraph, same with the second, third and so forth. And then you'll just read the conclusion. That should give you a general idea of what the article is about. And therefore, you're going to be ready to discuss it when in class. It takes, of course, some time to develop the skill fully so you're not missing the important pieces of information, but it helps you really to think analytically and to be able to extract important ideas from large bulk of information. Um, also, because we have so much to read these days that it's not possible to read from line to line. So it's just sometimes better to skim through and get just get a general feeling of what the book or the article is about. But I do want to bring to your attention that this is only possible for an academic journals written about international relations, maybe some theory, maybe some concept, but it's not very applicable in, let's say, biology or chemistry. I wouldn't recommend skimming through a biology book or chemistry book because every single word or every single term matters and it's important that you read it fully and you're able to grasp the information completely. Tip number seven is learn before going to sleep or learn in half a sleep state. I know this sounds very funny and this sounds very bizarre on its own, but actually it works. Uh, when I was a little kid, I used to be a host in one of the local uh, channels for a children program. And on Fridays after school, my mom would be reading to me the lines that I had to learn. And I was so tired after school that I was half asleep and she would read to me and I wouldn't be able to recite. But the next morning when I woke up, I was able to recite them fully. My mom observed this in me from very child, early childhood on. And when I was in school uh, and I was in the middle and high school later on, even in high school, my mom would read to me, for example, a poem that I had to learn by heart or maybe history chapter that I was too tired to read. So I was in bed half asleep and my mom would read the chapter to me and I would just be there half dreaming. But when I woke up the next morning, I had a full memory of the information. Apparently, this is something that's called sleep learning. 
and it works for things where you have to acquire new skills. So if you're learning a foreign language or if you need to learn a poem, that this is a very strong technique to apply. And actually, it works best with audio. With visuals, it could be a bit more difficult because in half a sleep state, you might not be able to retain the information well visually, but through your ears, you're going to be able to remember most of it. Tip number eight for those that are in college and love to pull an all-nighter, please do not underestimate the power of a good sleep. I know I've been guilty of pulling all-nighters a lot my freshman year and that's actually when my results weren't as great, but ever since I started pulling less of all-nighters, I was able to deliver better results. I did like to pull an all-nighter right before the exam, but a couple of days in advance, I made sure that I got a good amount of sleep. If you pull an all-nighter a couple of nights in a row before the exam, trying to cram all the information and to be able to read through everything that you haven't read throughout the whole semester, it will bring your concentration level down right on the day of the exam. When you're there under stress, under time pressure, and you're reading the question, just because you were sleep deprived, you might misread or misinterpret the question or make little minor calculation mistakes, whatever it might be. It might be a trivial mistake that will take off your points. And then when the day comes to actually get your results, you're going to be very disappointed in yourself because you knew it all. But just because you were so so sleepy you weren't paying attention or you weren't focused or concentrated enough so i urge you not to underestimate the power for good sleep because at the end of the day when you see your paper you're not going to be able to prove to your professor that just because you were sleep deprived you didn't understand the question well you answered it wrong you're not going to be able to prove it to anyone and it's going to be very disappointing for you so please make sure you get a good night's sleep a couple of nights before the exam and even if you pull an all-nighter before the exam, you'll be good to go. Number nine is surround yourself with a good environment, the stimulating environment, whatever that means to you. For me, I like studying in a very clean desk. I like having nothing but my laptop, a cup of tea perhaps, a hand cream maybe, a candle. I like to have less amount of paper or books on my on my desk so I'm able to concentrate better. I find that, that I'm able to focus better on the things that I need to learn when I have less amount of things on my desk. For other people that like to be messy creative, they love having books, piles of paper, uh, lots of things scattered around, they feel more creative in that setting. Whatever that setting is for you, understand what works for you and then make that environment suitable for you. Personally for me, I like to study alone or I like to study on my own alone or perhaps with another study buddy or maybe a maximum of three people. I didn't really like studying in like groups because I find it to be very distracting and I would spend hours and hours in library without actually delivering any kind of work. So when I went to library, I either did it alone or maybe with a friend of mine and would usually sit in a silent room. If that works for you, then do that. Don't feel pressured to join any study groups if you don't feel like this is going to be beneficial for you. However, for other people, they find it more stimulating when there are other people around them. I do also like studying in library or in areas where people are working. Uh, in college, this would be Starbucks. I'd go and study in Starbucks or Barnes and Noble. People had to keep quiet and they would be working and I would just be looking at them and knowing I'm not alone here studying. People are actually also studying and working instead of being alone on my own in the dorm room. I do love surrounding myself with people, but I prefer that everyone does their work and we're all just silently working. Tip number 10 is watch what you're eating. Studies have shown that we're able to concentrate on our studies best on an empty stomach. When we eat something, all the blood is drawn to our stomach and digestive system to help us break down the food, which is why we're, we're not able to concentrate and we get very sleepy. No wonder in different cultures around the world, people nap after lunch. Uh, in China they do that, in Spain they take siesta. It's natural that we want to sleep after eating. When I was reading the biography of Steve Jobs, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to his eating habits and how he went on different kinds of diets and tried to 
do a lot of work on empty stomach to boost his concentration level, to boost his creativity. And actually in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of different diets that people go on in order to stimulate their brain, in order to um, increase their concentration level. Um, and if you remember the speech that he gave in Stanford, he said, stay foolish, stay hungry. And stay hungry is an important element when studying. I think he meant it not just in terms of stay hungry for knowledge, but I also think he meant it stay hungry while studying. Because when you have an empty stomach, you're able to concentrate a lot better and deliver better results. When I was in the US, I was struck by the fact that a lot of the students loved snacking while studying. This wasn't really a thing we grew up doing. I don't snack at all. I usually have my proper meals throughout the day and in America there are all different kinds of snacks and when students study they surround themselves with all kinds of snacks and while studying they constantly are eating. I think this is not doing any justice neither to their studying nor to their health in general so it's bringing down their concentration level but also negatively impacting their health. So if you are studying, make sure that you sit down and concentrate on that. But if you do want to eat, take a break, go have your meal, have some peppermint tea or green jasmine tea or whatever helps with your digestion. Go around, take a walk and then come back and study more. Because this will not be an effective way when you are seated at one desk eating and studying in the same venue. Give your concentration to your activity you're doing, either it be your books, your reading or eating. Thank you so much for watching this video until the end and I do hope that you find this information useful and applicable in your daily life, especially if you're a student or not, maybe you're just studying for yourself. These tips have tremendously helped me in achieving the results that I wanted to achieve and I hope that you are able to do the same. Thank you and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!